Hello, this is the luckiest maths teacher in the world, and today we're going to look at group data and skewness one after the other. So I'll start with group data. So what I did for this is I actually went and looked up how many games have been played for the Broncos by my favourite players, and they are all from the Brisbane Broncos because we all know they're the best NRL team. So, for example, Darius Boyd has played 106 matches for the Broncos. He's a legend. I met him. Great guy. And so I'm just going to write other numbers of my favourite players, how many games they've played for the Broncos. Now, we might want to put this in a histogram because it's usually a lot better to look at something visual like that rather than just the whole thing of numbers. That gives us information very quickly, allows us to make efficient judgments about the data. So as I'm writing it though, what I hope you notice is that there's a huge range in the number of matches played by these players at the Broncos, and I'm sure it'd be the same at any club. So for instance, we've had someone play zero games, and we've had someone, actually Corey Parker, who's played, wow, 338 matches, that's a lot. So the thing is that because there is such a range of data, we might want to group it. So I'll show you why we want to group it by drawing a histogram. Now, I'm sure you know what a histogram is, but just to make it clear, a histogram is almost the same as a bar graph and a column graph. Bar graph and column graph are the same thing. But in a histogram, the bars touch each other, and we don't have categories down the x-axis like the colour of your hair. We have numerical data. So I'll draw up a histogram now. So remember for a histogram, it has two axes and the vertical axis, I'm just going to write FREQ for frequency. The vertical axis is always frequency. That is the number of times a particular score occurred. Now along the horizontal axis for a histogram, it's numerical data. And it's going to vary from question to question. In this case, our data is the number of games played. Now, if we wanted to do all of these numbers individually, as we sort of normally do, we'd start at zero and we need to make all these divisions all the way up to 338. That's going to take a long time. Another problem is that you might see this data up here has no mode. There is no score that occurs more than once. So it's just going to be a whole heap of bars like this. Okay, but that's really not going to be helpful. It's going to take a long time and it's not really going to do much. So I'm going to get rid of all that. And what we're going to do is we are going to group the data. Now I'm going to group it in groups of 50. So what I mean by that is I'm going to group together all of the scores so that each group has a length of 50. So the first group I'm going to do is 0 to 49. And then the next group will be 50 to 99 and so on. I'm sure you get the idea. So these are my groups. Now there's nothing magical about having group length of 50. I could have had a group length of 20 or a class interval of 20. So from 0 to 19, 20 to 39 and so on. I'd have more groups that way, but it might make the data a little more useful. So now I'm just going to draw up a frequency table, right? How many of each class, how many scores were in each class. So from 0 to 49, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 scores in total. You can see from 50 to 99, there is one score. From 100 to 149, there are two scores. 150 to 199, there's 1, 1, 0, and 1. So 15 scores in total. So what I do with this is I put all of the scores from 0 to 49 together in one bar. So first I've got to make sure I mark my vertical axis. So this is the frequency, so the highest score is 9, so I'm going to go from 0 to 10. Okay, so that's my vertical axis for frequency, and along the horizontal axis I'm going to put all of the classes. So the first one starts at 0, the next one starts at 50, and then 100... 150, 200, 250, 
and we have one starting at 300. Okay, so mine's not going to be entirely accurate in terms of the spacing because I can't use a ruler on this thing, but I'm sure yours will be. So from 0 to 49, there were 9 of them, so we just draw a bar up to 9. Remember, all of the bars have to touch each other. So that's the first group done. The next one has only one score there. The next one has two, so I draw it up to being in line with two on the vertical axis. Again, sorry, mine's a bit inaccurate. I know yours will be better. Then the next two have one in them. Then there's a gap and then there is one in the last one as well. So that is what the histogram looks like. So I've grouped the data and made it a lot more efficient and a lot more useful. So now I'm going to look at calculating the mean, median, and mode. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the scores above, and we're going to pretend we just have the histogram. So let's look at calculating mean, median, and mode. So I don't have each of the individual scores anymore. I've just got the histogram. So I, from that, I can't calculate any of them as normal. But there are ways that we can sort of estimate the mean. So what we do is we take each score in the class as if it was right in the middle of the class. So what I mean by that, in the first group, 0 to 49, there are 9 scores, and they... What I do is I pretend that each of those scores was the middle of 0 and 49. So 0 plus 49 divided to is 24 and a half. So I'm pretending I have 9 scores that were all equal to 24 and a half because otherwise I can't calculate the mean. So 9 times 24.5 and I do that for the next one. The middle of that group is 74 and there was one score. So I add that, and then in the next one there were two, and the middle is 100 plus 149 divided by two, which is 124.5. And then so on and so forth. So I add all these up, just like I would when I'm calculating the mean normally, and I divide by how many there are, 15 in total, put that on my calculator, and the answer I got was 84.5. So this might not be the actual mean of the data that I showed first up, but it sort of gives us a rough indication of the average. So on average, they've played about 85 games. So similarly for the next one, so the median, I can't calculate it exactly because I don't have all the data. So what I can do, however, is not calculate the median, but the median class. So similar to the actual median, the median class is the class such there are half of the observations or the same number of observations, really. It's the class, so there are the same number of observations in that class or in a higher class as there are in that class or a lower class. It's still trying to give us the middle point. So there are 15 scores in total. And so the median, 15 plus 1, 16 divided 2 is 8. The median will be whatever the 8th score is. Now you can see from our frequency table that the first 9 scores are from 0 to 49. So the 8th score is definitely in that class. So the median class will therefore be the class 0 to 49. So then what if I wanted to find the mode? Well, again... I can't find it exactly without knowing the actual data, but what I can do is find the modal class, the most common class, and this is of course very easy. You can see from the histogram that it is also the class 0 to 49. Similar to the normal mode, there can be more than one mode, it can be bimodal or whatever. All right, so that's all for group data. Now we're going to take a look at skewness. So copy anything down that you like because I'm going to go to a new slide. Okay, so what is skewness? Well, let's say that I told you that we had a class test. Average is 80 and the standard deviation is 20. So what that's telling you is the middle of the class is about 80 and then everyone was basically, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but most people were within 20 of the mean, either above it or below it. But skewness tells us something different about the data. It tells us whether there were many more high scores, 
whether there were many more lower scores or whether most scores were around the mean. And that's what we're talking about here. Were there lots of scores above the mean or lots of scores below the mean? Because unlike the median, the mean is susceptible to outliers and so scores can drag it up or drag it down. So I'm going to show you a few different histograms and what skewness looks like. Okay, so on the first one, I'm going to draw a histogram similar to the one that we saw, and it's going to have more scores towards the minimum of the data. So minimum is, of course, just the lowest score. And as you go further along, so scores are getting higher as we go this way, the frequency is lower. So remember that frequency is always on this axis here, the vertical axis or the y-axis, if you like. And so higher bars mean that, that, that those scores occurred more often. Now, I just want to say quickly that this principle of skewness works whether the data is normal, like we've been doing, or whether the data is grouped, like I did in the first part of this video. Okay, so in this histogram, we see that there are more scores closer to the minimum than to the maximum. Higher frequency scores are lower. Okay, so it probably seems a bit counterintuitive, but we actually call that data positively skewed. Okay, so there's a higher frequency of low scores. Now, it's important low can be subjective. What I mean by low is closer to the minimum of the scores, and that's what we saw in the first example. So the idea here is that the median is going to be somewhere around here because there are a lot of scores towards the bottom, but these scores at the top, which are less numerous, they're going to drag up the median. Uh, sorry, drag up the mean, they're not going to affect the median. So the idea here for positively skewed data is the mean is greater than the median. Now, predictably, the next type is called negatively skewed, and it's the opposite of positively skewed. So there are higher frequency of higher scores, meaning there are more scores closer to the maximum score than to the minimum score. And as you can probably guess, here the mean is less than the median. So its histogram would look like this. It'd have low frequency of scores down the bottom, but then as you go along, you'd expect generally the frequency is getting much higher. So there is a higher frequency of high scores. That means negatively skewed. Again, Make sure you understand this and make sure that you don't get mixed up. It probably seems counterintuitive that negatively skewed would have more high scores since we're talking negative, but that's the way it is. And that's because it is the negative or the lowest scores that drag down the mean. So the median's going to be up here somewhere and the lowest scores drag the mean down so it's lower than the median. So the last type of skew is actually not skewed at all. It is symmetrical and it's when the data is neither positively nor negatively skewed. So the mean will equal the median in this case, and there won't be more scores closer to the maximum or closer to the minimum. So it would probably look something like this. This is typical symmetrical data. And there should be a line of symmetry. Now, what I want to point out is that in our course here, we're not actually doing this as accurate as we could. There are very sophisticated ways involving calculus that where we could find the skewness, but we're just going to be looking at histograms and looking at the mean and median. So this one here is symmetrical about this line here. You all know what symmetry is, okay? Now I just want to show you how you can find skewness from stem and leaf plots, so please copy this down if you need it. Okay, so here is a stem and leaf plot. Now it's basically just a histogram on its side. I made up this data completely, but what you can see is there are a lot of scores that are closer to the minimum of the scores. So the lowest score here is one, there are more scores closer to it. Okay, 
So as I was telling you before, that means the data is positively skewed. So if you have an iPad, you can even turn this on its side and it will look like a histogram. This has been the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Have a great day.